Growth Pod is brought to you by Genero, a leading growth agency in the Nordics. We interview marketing experts, business leaders, and entrepreneurs to uncover the stories and strategies behind profitable growth. Today I'm joined by Lisa Gilbert, Vice President of Global Marketing at Kindrel. Uh, Kindrel is the world's largest provider of IT infrastructure services. Uh, Lisa previously held senior marketing positions at IBM, including Chief Marketing Officer in Japan and in the UK. Uh, welcome to the show, Lisa. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. So before we kind of get into your work at Kindrel, uh, I'd love to talk a little bit about your background. You okay. worked at IBM for over 20 years, which is becoming kind of that lot length of a tenure is becoming a bit of a rarity. Yeah. And people feel that they must switch employers every two to three years in order to make progress and build their breadth and depth of experience and, and build their resumes. So I'd love if you could kind of explain what led you to make that decision or, or was it like a conscious decision and what did that tenure allow you to do or what kind of opportunities that did that create for you? Yeah. You're right. So thank you for having me. And um, and I know it is a bit of a, kind of a unicorn, kind of kind of unique to be at a company for so long in this day and age. Um, but first of all, it didn't feel like when you say 20 years, I'm like, wow, that feels like a long time. Um, it wasn't the first company I joined. I worked at Hewlett Packard Company before that. And I worked with Compact Computer Corporation in, back in the day. Um, but um, it, it, I have to say, um, it was... It, it served me pretty well, um, um, based on what I like to do anyway. I mean, I really, really um, have a lot of passion um, to uh, work in a market. I was born in Japan, or as I sometimes like to say, made in Japan, and I lived there for the first 10 years of my life. So I've always been kind of different. I've been an outsider. I've had to figure out how to fit in. Um, and part of the way you do that is either you learn the language or you learn the culture and you just try and understand the beauty of each of these cultures. And that's something I learned really early that I like to do and I was good at. So um, I think IBM kind of harnessed that and um, uh, gave me the opportunity and I gave them the sweat equity to go and uh, drop into a couple of amazing countries that I was able to work in. Um, and that, that, once I started to be, you know, at the end of the day, whatever you do, you, you end up being known for something, right? Like, are you known as a great strategist? Are you known as a growth driver? Some people are known as really good at kind of breaking things apart and starting over. Um, I became known as someone who had the ability to drop into a market and to, and to figure out how to apply what was happening from a global level into a local level in a way that was respectful to the local people, the local customers, and the local you know norms and ways and means. And um, I don't think I would have had all the opportunity I had. So I've lived in France, I've lived in London, I've lived in Japan, I've lived in China, um, without being known for that. And that took some time, right? That took it took time for me to build that personal brand and that equity and that trust with the people in my company to or IBM at the time to send me to these places, invest in me to do the job in these places as well. So I don't know if I would have been able to do that if I bounced from company to company to company. That makes a lot of sense. But this concept of personal equity inside the company or organization, I don't think that's, I don't really, I haven't really heard about that. So it feels like it's something that is, it's not talked about. Would you therefore give advice or how, how would you give advice to someone who's who's like, you know, there have been maybe two years at a company and and they're thinking about, you know, maybe there's another opportunity with a slightly higher pay. Um, how do you think about balancing progress or like career advancement versus that personal equity inside a yeah. company? I mean, when you first start out, like you just kind of do what you do, right? And you, uh, most of us, like unless you're becoming a doctor or a lawyer, you kind of stumble into kind of your first job and then you... And then you build from there. Um, I first, I think you have to know who you are and you have to know what you love and what gives you passion and what makes you want to wake up every morning and love kind of, you know, love going to work every day. And uh, if it's making money, um, that, that would be a great formula to start to bounce from place to place, right? I mean, that's how you make as much money quickly as possible uh, based on what I've seen. 
Um, if it's uh, getting up, if you getting opportunity globally, you pick a global company like I did, right? I, I didn't pick a hungry little startup, which is amazing in its own right, right? If you're a huge risk taker, pick the like the hungry little growth companies that gives you like that opportunity to go sell and make it big. And then because you love building things from scratch and not that I don't get any opportunity to build stuff from scratch because I did, I think we've coined that term, intrapreneurship. I've had the opportunity to be an entrepreneur at IBM, which which was hard too because you had to get a lot of stakeholder um, um, agreement on getting something done that's met, never been done before, but that has its own rewards as well, right? So you have to know yourself pretty well. Um, and for me, I loved working at a global company knowing that I could have had the opportunity to do global work. Now, I started at IBM in Paris, so I, I already got the bug right then. I was a local hire in Paris, and um, and I knew the power of what could be because I saw it firsthand until I came back to headquarters or over to headquarters uh, for the first time. So yeah, you kind of have to know what motivates you and then pick your path. That's uh, I think that's really good advice. So you spent over 20 years at IBM and now you're at Kindrel. What was what was that kind of process like? What made you want to jump on on this opportunity of creating something new? Or... Well, well, creating something new is something I love to do. Uh, learning something new is something I love to do. Um, and um, what marketer gets this opportunity to build a brand from scratch, which is actually an $18 billion brand with 90,000 people, right? Like I... That was kind of once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, and after 20 years of the things that I've, that I've, I've gotten a lot of joy out of, um, I got this opportunity to take this leap. Um, I tend to, and I've seen this in my career, you've heard the phrase, look before you leap. I'm kind of a leap before you look gal. And um, that has its own issues as well. Um, I, I decided to go and take the giant t China job and with 24 hours of notice and kind of made that call and, it was amazing, but um, it was hard too, right? So, uh, so yeah. So um, I just leaped, and um, I never looked back. So let's just kind of unpack that. You mentioned, like you said, this was a completely unique opportunity to create a global brand from scratch. So, yeah, let's let's talk a little bit about that. The thought process that went into that. What have you learned um, about branding and, and building a global brand in in, in this process? So the first thing I learned is like branding is no joke, man. Branding is hard work, like like building a brand and really doing it thoughtfully and really do it, understanding the power of brand, really the power of brand, not like, you know, you slap a logo, you know, kind of onto a water bottle or whatever, right? I don't know if you can see that, but like, uh, but yeah, it's, it is, it is thoughtful, meaningful, hard work from like building a brand purpose and really figuring out how to build a brand purpose through to understanding how to build a brand architecture. And I think I'd say the first thing that I learned is you have to pitch a big tent, right? So you can't brand like on the nose. So a great example I learned while I was going through this is um, Dunkin' Donuts. I don't know if you've, you've heard of Dunkin' Donuts, right? So so at that time, they were making donuts. And, um, and, and then as they like... Um, moved out to coffee and to smoothies and to wraps, they ha they decided to rebrand to DD, right? So so you so they kind of opened that aperture. Um, if you're forward thinking enough, um, you're able to build no build pitch that big tent. Um, the big tent for us is we decided that our brand promise was the heart of progress, and that's pretty aspirational, right? Like we kind of came in and we had these big ideas and we had these big dreams. Um, we, 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 we're really good at, or we're the largest managed infrastructure services provider in the world. Um, but we had bigger aspirations. So really understanding when we sat with our CEO and Maria Winans, our CMO, they sat together and they really thought long and hard about what they want to be, not today, but in the future. And we came up with Art of Progress. And that really is about our brand promise it's together. Each of us advances the systems that, um, enables human progress and, that's saying a lot too, right? Living up to that brand promise. So really pitching a really big tent is kind of the first goal or the first thing I learned and then figuring out how to live up to it. Um, the other thing that I learned 
um, and this was a new one for me too. I think they're all kind of new ones for me, um, is um, walking the talk. So there's the brand, right? We have this brand, it's called Kindrel, and I could talk a little bit if you, if you want about why we're called Kindrel, but because um, um, that starts with, it's really hard to name something these days, like really, really hard. If you actually look at the trademarks for our specific um, spe specific category of IT services, there's like well over a million trademarks out there already. So actually finding a name that's like not like a made up name like ours is Kindrel um, is really, really difficult. So, um, so I can get to that in a sec, but it's really around connecting what we do with um, the, the Kindrels themselves. So Kindrel is a, um, is a people-based company. Our brand is experienced through us, me, a Kindrel. Um, and, um, and this part, part of that, we had to get really clear as to what, who we are and what we were. Um, so we really rooted it into the culture that we wanted to build. And we built this culture um, with we, which we named the Kindrel Way. And it's really around always moving forward. Um, we have three elements of that. It's restless, empathetic, and devoted. It may be, maybe on purpose, maybe not, is that stands for red. red. Warm red is our brand color. But really restless about not agit up restless, but restless about the po power and the promise of wanted to, wanting to continually improve, empathetic about our ability to listen and to ask really smart questions, and then devoted, which is committed to us and our customers' shared success. And we've kind of documented it, and every day we try and live the Kindrel way, and if we forget sometimes, we kind of throw, this looks like a red card for soccer, but like we throw, we have the Kindrel way leadership handbook that we can kind of look to if we need to. Um, but yeah, so all our, our brand is rooted in our culture because our, the Kindrel, the brand is represented through us Kindrels, us 90,000 Kindrels. You, you mentioned a couple of like the, the brand assets and how thoughtful you were when it came to designing them, everything from logo to name to culture handbook. Can you talk about someone, uh, or kind of address this skepticism that I sometimes see about like, well, branding is really this wishy-washy thing. We'll just, you know, whatever, it doesn't really matter. We can change it up however, however we like, but it seems like your focus is really, no, we need to be very thoughtful about it. And then we need to stay very consistent. So do you think that that is actually really key also in a B2B context, uh, to build a strong brand and what's, what are the kind of the, the positive yeah. tangibles from, from building a strong brand like that thoughtfully? So. I think the biggest thing that I learned, and I would not say that I'm a brand guru by any means. I just I have dabbled in it, um, and but I've learned so much from it. Is if you believe that brand is a synonym for the word trust, right? So think of any brand that you know and love, right? Um, my Remoa is my, I think it's maybe Remova and on Mara that the the suitcase company love them. Um, they they are known or any brand is known for something and if you're known for something you have to live up to that promise and that builds trust between you and your customer set um once you'd establish what you're known for if you show up differently so i'm wearing right now a jean jacket a white t-shirt let's say that's what i'm known for and you know i have brown hair and i don't wear glasses or whatever and if i showed up differently every single time I showed up with pink hair or I showed up with crazy Elton John glasses or I showed up, um, you know, with, you know, constantly changing. I would, you wouldn't really know what to think of me. You wouldn't know what I'm known for. You wouldn't know how to trust me. And I equate that to any brand, right? So whether it's Coca-Cola, whether it's Microsoft, whether it's Apple, you know, and, and or whether it's Kindrel, right? Like we, we need to show up consistently every time. And I just, if you actually sit and explain that to people, then it it, it makes it much easier to, for people to understand, okay, I understand the color for Kindrel is warm red. You can't change it to pink, right? Because if you show up pink, then, you know, I also explain why it's warm red and why we came up, why we were so deliberate with coming up with the imagery and the color and the need for vitality and all that good stuff. But um, it's this idea of trust and showing up the same way based on the promise you've given every single time. You mentioned that consistency. And I think 
you know, if you're a small startup serving one market, you're like, God, it will just be consistent. Kindrel also, like you mentioned, you have 90,000 employees. I think customers in like 60 countries around the globe. How, so how do you mention that need for localization, which is, I guess, key to trust? Like you need, it needs to be familiar. It needs to be properly contextualized for your culture. Um, yeah. With the need for like global consistency. How do you manage that yeah. tension? So, so well, we do. We have a uh, brand handbook that, uh, and a uh, kind of a brand um, like playbook that everybody at Kindrel should know about or knows about or has access to. Um, so that's number one. Then we also have a brand ambassador program. So it was really fun to build that program where we um, went out to all ninety thousand Kindrels and we asked them to do a video, however they wanted. Um, as to why they should be a brand ambassador, and they like thousands of people posted posted these videos that my team at the time went through every single one of them. We now have like 109 or 110 brand ambassadors all around the world. Um, many of them are in India because a big big chunk of our workforce is in India, and um, they um, they know the brand rule book or our playbook like cold. And so, so there are eyes and ears on the ground to teach and there are eyes and ears on the ground to, to correct should something come out um, off, for example, right? So, so then we, with that playbook, we, we lay out like what our color palette is um, and we lay out what the imagery, the importance of imagery is and why. And then it shows up, like for example, in India, whenever I go to India, the Indian culture, they, they do this amazing, I wish I knew what they were called, but they do these amazing um, petal art, you know, so they take petal flowers and petals and they make this gorgeous art around any kind of festivity. And so making the petal art with the brand color palette is absolutely on brand, for example, right? So it's not that we're saying you can't make the petal art. Of course you can, because that is a really big, big thing as part of Indian culture. You know, for example, we just asked you to do it aligned to the colors, for example, if you want to make a brand statement, right? If it's important for you to make a brand statement. So we ask people to, um, when we, when they put the, the branding around all the environments or all the offices we have, we give a plant brand playbook because for a customer to walk into an office in India and have it look like the office in New York or the office in Munich or anywhere around the world or in Sao Paulo or whatever, um, again, it's back to this, like you want it you want people to know that you're showing up the same way every single time. This idea of like activating your employees is, it, it, it seems like that's there's a huge untapped opportunity and a lot of companies struggle to do that. Um, and, and just like practically speaking, if, if companies at, you know, certainly at your scale, but even smaller companies, if they could get even a fraction of their employees posting on LinkedIn, that would do probably huge things for, for their uh, brand awareness. So, so what do you think about what's kind of key to actually getting employees at scale to start to activating them and, and help them become ambassadors for the company? You know, it's a good question. I feel we were really lucky with the 90,000 kid girls that we have. So many of them are passionate about, um, social eminence and, and posting on social media. Um, I don't know if it was because they were part of something bigger and didn't feel, their uniqueness while we were a division of IBM. Um, and then once we gave a brand identity and a voice, a brand voice to these people, they felt very, very excited to exert that exert that voice. Um, but, but it's really around how important it is to do that because we, we aren't at a place where we are, our, our stock price isn't at a place where we want it to be yet. We said we're a three to five year deal. So we're moving in the right direction. We're really excited about the trajectory we have and some of the feedback we've been getting from the investor community. Um, but um, it's giving access to appropriate brand assets for pe people to then, then post those on social media. And one of the things I'm most proud of when I was running the brand um, at the time was this um, user-generated content campaign um, we did around our first year anniversary around something called Kid to Kindrel. So essentially, we gave just a few guidelines of people, you know, bring a photo of you as a kid. And we want, and a big part of um, of our our brand is about curiosity. And um, we talk about we're being, we're pro-curiosity. And so we say, talk about what you were curious about as a kid and how, how does it turn you into 
who you are today. Um, so you saw, started seeing all these gorgeous posts on the day of We Let It Fly, uh, people coming up with photos of themselves as children around cultures all around the world um, and talking about what they were curious as a kid and why they've turned into an engineer or why they turned into selling in the travel and transportation um, um, sector or why they do marketing or why they do communications or why they, they're a developer or whatever. And they, it was this gorgeous tie that we just didn't give a lot of structure. We just gave li- really light structure and then it just exploded. And I think we just won a lovely award in the UK for, for that campaign. So, so yeah, that would be a br- really proud moment of where we gave some assets to the Kindrels themselves and it just kind of exploded and it went on, uh, it went viral. And it must be really cool to see when you have such a huge and diverse uh, employee base. It really kind of takes on a life of its own, I guess. Yeah, it did. Very cool. I, def- I definitely want to talk more about content, but before just going briefly back to something you mentioned, the investor community. And it sounds from talking to you like you have, at Kindrel, been able to bring the importance of br- branding is really valued and it's been brought to like the top of the, the company. And mm-hmm. it's also something that is not really very tangible, which I guess the investor community likes to see. They like to see hard numbers. So how do you, um, how have you kind of been able to focus so much on branding and, and have it be such a core part of your strategy in the midst of being a public company and, and, uh, having to maybe, I guess, justify those investments. How yeah. have you like generally thought about that? At Kindred? I wouldn't say, you know what? I just think we, um, when we spun, we had a, a, a appropriate budget to spend around the world. But then, like, you know, everyone's these days, everyone's marketing budget constrained. Um, we are in startup mode. So uh, we have to figure out how to be much more scrappy than being able to buy tons and tons of media, for example. We don't have that luxury yet, right? Um, we will one day. I really, really believe we will. Um, so you do have to use, I mean, we are so lucky to have the 90,000 controls out there, right? To be able to amplify that brand in many, many different ways not just on social, but like speaking at, you know, on panels or speaking at conferences, what we do from a a PR perspective, right? So, so you just have to figure out um, more scrappy ways to um, understand how to get the brand out there like that, that kind of creative campaign around kid to kindro, for example, right? So, so yeah, and then you have to get people excited, people to come on board with you. And I think one of the most excited person is our CEO, Martin. Who, who loves his brand, probably because he had a whole lot of um, his fingerprints on it, to be quite honest. And, um, and you know, everywhere he goes, he makes sure things that are that he sees are on brand in every single country. It's so interesting because you mentioned, like, what you, you have the budgets are constrained and you're trying to look for scrappy ways that you can build a brand globally, but you're also doing it at a scale that, I mean, no other company virtually in the world is doing. So I'd love to get a little bit into like that playbook that you're running. Like what are some of the tactics, channels, and ways? You mentioned a couple. Are there anything else that you're doing that allows you to build a brand by bypassing the sort of the more traditional expensive sure. routes? So besides so besides um, um, so the social activation that we do, and that's where we lean in, um, then we get just, we really prioritize very, very significantly. So for example, when it comes to a uh, paid social, uh, like well, when it comes to our our media mix, we really, really lean into paid social. That's where we put all of our media eggs in that basket, um, and we also hyper geo target, right? So um, I'm uh, I also run, so I I I have the field of the Kindrel field marketers report into me, and as does account based marketing. So we have the subset of accounts that are really, really important for us for us to grow. Um, to to make our numbers, and so even with that, we're able to geo target to ensure that um, those customers know who we are and what we stand for. I mean, because we're still in, you know, how is Kindle Kindr- differ differ from um, the division that we are, were with our former employer, and how are how are we showing up differently? Right, and this ties back to the Kindle way about how we show up in front of our clients in a very different way. So. Geotargeting is one uh, tool that we use to be able to get hyper-targeted and then also search, right? So uh, from that perspective. 
Wow, that's really interesting that like the digital, the performance marketing, paid social search is really a core part and you're doing it all around the world without having to kind of um, choose more expensive, let's say, media channels. Yeah. Hey, don't get me wrong. We'd love to. I mean, when we when we launched, we jacked uh, Times Square. We jacked Shibuya Crossing. And that was fun, right? That was really fun. But uh, you know, to, need to kind of need to deliver what we promised to the street. And then, you know, once we do, those days will come back. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, what has been um, your proudest moment or biggest win uh, so far at Kindrel? Anything that stands out? Well, a personal amazing moment for me is when we went to the stock exchange and we launched on the, uh, launched on the New York Stock Exchange our 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 our, our moniker KD, which is our stock symbol. Um, but then, like you know, that was amazing. You know, just seeing that and planning that and creating that experience. And the interesting thing on that was um, we decided that our primary target for that was our employees. So we made this incredible employee experience for them. So for people all around the world. Um, the exchange did a, does an amazing job of, of, of giving you a bird's eye view and a front seat to all of that. So that was really, really cool. But I think I've said it, the coolest project I worked on is this kind of kid to Kindrel piece on um, really taking what we believe in as our brand, which is our people, and then really not giving a lot of structure, but activating it globally in a way that was made sense for each of the different cultures and each of the, each of the different markets. So let's let's talk about that a little bit. What was, I guess, the general question is: How do you think about content specifically? Choosing what type of content campaigns to run? Like, is it a very qualitative, sorry, quantitative approach, or is it just trying to like understand your culture, your people, what would resonate, understand customers, and just like creatively coming up with ideas like that? Like, what what does that process look like for you? Well, I think we we're uh, we're the way our operating model works is um, um, all the members of our global team. So whether it's our global content team, our global brand team, they're all in service of the folks on the ground, right? So whatever is built um, is built for the people to take it over the line, right? As a, I mean, that's a services company. That model makes um, sense. As a, if you're a SaaS company, I think you have a different model because technology it plays a much bigger uh, role in your actual marketing because the tech itself does the marketing, right? So, so we, we we go down the services model, and essentially we get take feedback from markets as to what they need, and then we give enough structure and have it translated into the appropriate languages, and then um, we give enough flexibility on the ground for the team to take it over the line. So. So whether we, you know, a big part of uh, what we offer to our clients or customers is um, helping them modernize their applications and their infrastructure. Um, and so we've come up with a, a kind of a modernization white paper, and then we break it down into its um, derivative assets, and then we send that out to the markets, and the markets use them in whatever journey that's appropriate to them based on what role they're trying to build relationships with. So. Um, they take, if it's a CISO role, so a chief information security officer role, they go down the, the secure line. If um, it's a, um, if it's a DevOps person, they go much down the, go down the technical line. Um, but if it's a, you know, I don't know, a, um, so a, a chief sustainability officer, we go down like the sustainability at line. So we give them kind of piece parts for them to put together um, uh, to deliver whatever they need. Any thoughts on what is kind of required in terms of standing out? Right now, the news feeds are full. Everyone's posting. Now there's AI-generated content that's kind of already, I think, starting to, to, to show up at, at pretty large large scale. So do you have any thoughts on, like, how can we compete? How can we stand out? How can we be interesting in this new environment? You know what? I don't, I don't yet. I'm still a student of it, um, and I'm kind of watching it. It's, it's scary a little bit from my perspective, right? Uh, everything that's being created. I mean, watching what's happening with the, um, the, uh, the, the, the screen actors, the, the, the writer's strike, the actor's guild strike, and how powerful they are to protect themselves about, about you know, from kind of AI-generated content taking their IP. And so, so I'm just kind of watching it play out right now. I'm not ready to make any major, major statements around like, uh, 
what we're going to do. Probably knowing us, we'll test and learn, right? So we'll constantly test and learn and we'll go and we'll try something and we'll see if it works or if it doesn't. Um, and we'll kind of test and learn our way through. Speaking of kind of studying and, and, and learning, what are are your kind of go-to places, resources, tools for making sure that you keep, sorry, to stay up to date with everything that's happening in the world of marketing? You know, it's a good question. I um, honestly, I, um, this might be a shameless plug, but um, I am a big believer in this um, program that I took in 2018 called the Marketing Academy. Um, it's their fellowship program and it's for CMOs who aspire to be CEOs or be on boards. And, um, it's for a select group of CMOs. So it's, it, I was told it was hard to get in, but you know, I don't know any, what's the line, anyone who would accept me. I don't, I don't know if I value their judgment, but whatever. It's a, a unique board level executive development program. And, um, what it gives you is, well, it gives you a McKinsey education, which is amazing. Um, it gives you mentors from the best in class CEOs and board chairs. So you can kind of hear directly from them. Um, it gives you your own personal coach, a board level exec coach. But the most important thing is you you come out of there with this incredible cohort of people. My cohort is absolutely amazing. It's what I call my personal cabinet. So whenever I need any help, there's someone I can um, call up. And there's actually a larger alumni crew that um, I can call up at any time. Just an example of that is um, when the queen died, um, a lot of us in the U.S. anyway, we're like, what should we do? What makes sense? What's respectful? So we ha hopped on to, you know, I hopped on to that, that WhatsApp chat group and started to understand what other markets, other brands were doing. And it gave me more of a steer. And it was like a, 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 a instant focus group for me um, than, you know, trying to figure out and making a mistake, for example. Right. Wow, that sounds so valuable to have a, a group of peers who are, like-minded and uh, just incredibly competent and kind of focused on what you're trying to achieve as well. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Is there anything that stands out from that education in terms of, well, these are the skill sets or, or uh, knowledge that CMOs or marketers in general would need or benefits from acquiring if they want to transition eventually to become CEOs or? Well, a lot of things. Um, I think that would be a whole nother podcast to be quite honest. But, um, you know, first of all, speaking the language of the board, right? So really not coming at it from, you know, your deep marketing um, um, career approach, not career, marketing language. And really like if you're engaging with your CFO, speaking the language of the CFO, if you're speaking with your CEO, you're speaking the language of CEO. So it helped me understand those languages so I could um, adapt what I do to help them understand how it will benefit the company or benefit the bottom line eventually, you know, that kind of thing. So build and taught me building relationships, right? Building how to build relationships with people at that level as well. Um, and then the big thing it also taught me a lot about um, how to work with different cultures and different people from different cultures, because uh, not all cultures um, are the same. And um, as, as the world's become smaller with the internet, um, and I have a job right now where I work with CMOs from, you know, the 60 different markets that we serve. Um, what I say and what they hear aren't always the same. So really learning how to adapt your style. Uh, but being a study a student of, um, of kind of cultural differentiation and communication um, from that perspective. It's, um, it's, that's a big, big learning. I learn that every single day. You're right. We could definitely do another podcast about <laughs> all of those things. Lisa, um, it's been really great talking to you. Thank you so much for taking the time. If sure, people, it's my pleasure. If people want to connect with you, learn more about what you're doing and follow you, what's the, the best place to do that? Well, the best place to do that is on LinkedIn. And uh, I just, I don't know if this, this would be such a crazy thing if it actually works. I don't know if it's going to work. But uh, I have a QR code on LinkedIn. I'm just going to pop it up just to see. Maybe it will. Maybe it won't. You can okay. get, connect I with hope me some, on that. I hope someone will try scanning that. I'll try. That'd be cool. Who knows? <laughs> maybe it will work. Maybe it won't. But yeah, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. That's the best way to do it. I'll also add the, the URL in the show notes. Oh, Once thank again, you. Once again, Lisa, that. thank you so much. Um, have a great rest of the day. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. 
Thank you for listening. You can find all episodes of The Growth Pod on Spotify, YouTube, and Apple Podcasts.